Today, we've got a very interesting debate coming up. Um, it's got the longest title um, of the debate that we've had so far. The title is, If a Tree Falls in the Forest and Nobody's There to Hear It, Does It Still Make a Sound? Um, so um, we came up with that debate when, uh, with the title, Kira and I were talking about um, people who um, do design for good, work in socially engaged ways, um, work on projects that maybe don't have the immediate aim to make a lot of money, but have the aim of kind of helping a particular group or helping a particular community. And we were talking about the relationship between working on those kinds of projects and um, publicity and what kind of background you come from to do those projects. So we've got two speakers today who um, do these types of projects, do design for good, do the socially engaged design, but they come from very, very different backgrounds. Um, so our first speaker is um, Tara Austin, who works for Ogilvy, which I'm sure you've all heard of, is a big advertising agency, a global advertising agency. She's done some very, very interesting projects as part of Ogilvy, which she's going to tell you about. And our second speaker is Neil from a very, very small, but well, comparatively small um, agency called Neo Design in Brighton. Um, and Neo Design are very, very kind of mindful about who their clients are, and they've got very strict guidelines about who, what, what type of people they even enter into relationships with. So they come at this kind of subject of doing design for a good cause from two very, very different angles. So we're going to have the two. So like, like last week, we're going to have two short presentations from our speakers. So Tara's going to go first, and Neil's going to go second, and then we're going to have ten minutes again for you discuss amongst yourselves, um, to think about the two different kind of viewpoints that have been um, brought forward, um, to think about questions and points of debate that you would like to raise, and then we'll kind of open it up to the room again and have a kind of general discussion. So I think um, doing, it that, doing it like that last week worked really well. Okay, so we're going to start now with Tara Austin from Overly. Hey. Hi everyone, uh, so that's my name, and uh, I work at Overly and Mailer, which is one of the biggest and oldest advertising agencies on the planet, um, and if we ever colonise the moon, we'll probably be there. We had uh, the first agency in Myanmar, like Burma, Mailer, as, and um, we do a lot of work with just about every client you could possibly think of, from WWF through to BP. Um, so we work with everyone somewhere in some corner of the world. Um, and it's all because of this man. This is David Ogilvy, our founding father. We have his signature in our logo. And um, he was the original madman, really, or madman. I'm sure you're probably familiar with the TV show. Um, and if you haven't read any of his work, if you're interested in advertising at all, um, he's a great copywriter. He's extremely opinionated, or he was. Um, and he's the king of the soundbite. So he's got a lot of great quotes. You can throw an Ogilvy quote at just about any problem. He's really great for presentations just uh, in case you ever have to make any. Um, but I wanted to start, before I get into the Ogilvy-isms, uh, with a question, and it's totally rhetorical, don't feel like you have to put your hand up and say yes, but who here would be happy if they spent the rest of their life working on your projects, whatever that might be, and they never felt proud of anything at the end of it? I'm assuming none of you, because I know from from my own experience on planet Earth, um, that's what I want to do. And I'd like to talk, I suppose, about this word pride. Because on the one hand, I think it's the motivating force in all of us. We want to do something that shows that we existed, that we contributed to the world, um, that we did something. Something uh, we can go home ideally and tell our mums or grannies about. Something we can feel proud of. And yet, it's a very pejorative word. It's a word that says, oh, you shouldn't feel proud about that. If somebody's got pride, excessive pride, um, then they, they're not really entitled to be publicly speaking about their achievements. Um, so I'd like you to think about this word pride in the context of what it is um, I do, what it is Neil does. Um, and I'd first like to throw up well, basically a, a bit of a, what I think is a misconception, but a blast from the past, something for you to think about.
Joey is the evil genius, right? Because although on a personal level, it is very admirable that uh, Phoebe wants there to be more selfless acts in the world. And we all, I'm sure, believe in love and altruism on some level. But I'm not here to talk to you about what you do between you and someone else. I'm here to talk to you about what you do kind of professionally in the world and ideally how you contribute towards society. Um, and when you contribute towards society, pride has an awful lot to do with it because you're trying to achieve something, not just on behalf of yourself, um, but on behalf of the bigger community. Uh, and pride is a motivating factor. Uh, this is my one and only Ogilvyism of the, of the presentation, but don't bunt, aim out of the ballpark, aim for the company of immortals. Why is this inspiring? Because it's, it's glorious. It's talking about what you can achieve in the world, what you can do. And ultimately, when you do that great thing, you really want people to be able to talk about it. You really want, you're invested in it. You want to feel that pride in what you do. And professionally, that's extremely important. So I think the one thing I would like to say to you here today is don't always think of pride as something that is, um, that is negative, that is shameful, that is something that we shouldn't be allowed to indulge in. Because actually what pride does is reflect back on great achievements. And when those achievements are for the good of society, then there can be no wrong. The thing is, I feel it boils down to two elements. Either you're personally invested or you're personally protected. Because when we talk about um, social achievement, there's risk. Um, there's risk uh, if, it's a, if it's a client I'm working with. There's risk for the agency. Um, there's risk for me personally. And that's if I am personally invested Otherwise, I can protect myself in my own little bubble of going about my daily business um, and continuing to do the things that everybody has always done before. But to be truly creative, as I'm sure you know, it requires risk and that requires investment. Um, and that investment always comes back, I think, to, to pride. Are you, are, you, are you prepared to be committed? Are you prepared to take on the risk personally? Um, are you prepared to um, admit failure? You know, these are not easy questions, but ultimately it's a matter of bravery. Ultimately, it's a matter of being prepared to go for the immort immortality, um, because ultimately you're getting something out of it. Um, I've got an example of something that I worked on, um, and the only thing I can really show you is the case study with you uh, that won a gold line in Cannes. Woo, great. Um, like the highest kind of accolade in our industry. And yet, um, when we went into the project, there was, no, there was no intention whatsoever, whatsoever of entering it for any kind of award. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that I wasn't very much personally invested in the project and driven by my own sense of being proud to do something in the world. Um, the fact that people then talked about it, the fact that my agency wanted to enter it for awards, I didn't want to, um, the fact that they did all of these things is great. Um, and I'm enormously proud of the outcome, um, but I was also proud going into it of trying to achieve something and being prepared to take a risk. Because it's not easy. Little film. As the London riots of August 2011 took hold, people in Greenwich burnt down the pub they drank in and looted the shops where they bought their food. But as the disturbances died down, antisocial behaviour in the area continued. Greenwich Council needed to find a way to stop the problem minority from destroying their own community. We believe that the very shutters that were ripped from their runners could be part of the problem. Could we turn the shutters into part of the solution? We wanted to conduct a social experiment. In 2009, a team of scientists in Pennsylvania found proof that the large head, round face and big eyes so beloved of Disney actually motivates caring behaviour in adults. They prove that cute matters to the brain. If I was in local government, I know it would be a lot easier to say, I'm getting more police out there, than to say, I'm painting a few shutters. And I think we need to work to build confidence that these kind of interventions have their role, that they work and they have their role, and get them taken seriously as hard interventions, which are expensive and in the past have proven not to work. Could the power of cute minimize antisocial behavior in Greenwich? After a campaign to recruit local babies and a long night painting, our shutters were resplendent with cute babies' faces 
our experiment had begun. Since our experiment started six months ago, none of the shutters have been vandalized, and the locals are enjoying feeling much safer. We've got positive images around, it makes you think positive. And it didn't take thousands of pounds or hundreds more police, just a few cans of paint. The people of Greenwich have shown an overwhelming love for the babies, and the shopkeepers have embraced the idea as their own. And before long, communities all around the world were talking about it too. Because when you understand human behavior, it can be the tiny changes that have the most powerful effect. This could be the dawn of a new era in crime prevention. project was my baby, was something that I wanted to do. Um, that film had absolutely nothing to do with me. I didn't put it together. My agency put it together because they thought they were proud of what we'd achieved and what we did, the team that I put together to um, do this tiny little experiment. But nonetheless, my motivation going into it, it wasn't the publicity, fine, but it was I wanted to achieve something in the world. I wanted something I could tell my mum about. Um, something that I could feel proud of uh, doing and I was absolutely <coughs> invested. I was personally invested from the very beginning and it was a risk. Um, yes, we brought down antisocial behaviour according to the Met, um, but there's a lot of other factors involved with antisocial behaviour. Um, and it was a big risk, maybe it could have all gone up, maybe crime could have shot through the roof. Um, it was a tiny, tiny little experiment um, and I Going into it, our intention was never, uh, we're going to do this thing and then brag to the world about how great it is. The fact that it then carried and people wanted to talk about it and it captured people's imaginations as far away as Brazil, um, that was just a, um, a very nice uh, bonus, if you like, to something that we wanted to do in Woolwich down the road because we were all affected by the riots. So I think. To achieve any of these kinds of projects, you need to be motivated. And you need to be motivi motivated essentially by what you're going to get out at the end of it. Um, and I think that's pride to some point, to some extent. But in order to do that, you have to be very much personally invested in the project. Um, and that kind of level of personal investment, it, it comes with huge amounts of risk. This is another thing that I've been involved with recently. Um, Ogilvy Africa, uh, we're working with um, the Department for International Development here in the UK and a whole consortium of NGOs to try and create the first ever umbrella campaign against female genital mutilation. This is hard work. This is, it, dealing with the government is always really, really, really hard work. Um, and just developing a name that a billion different people would agree to, let alone a visual identity and a logo, it, it's not easy. And again, you have to put yourself out there. And every conversation you're having with every client, with every stakeholder, you're, you're invested in the project. And then when it comes off and it's launched, and Leonard Dunham and Catelyn Moran are wandering around with badges with this on, you do feel pride because you know that you've taken risks, um, that you've shown your own kind of bravery in order to get there. Um, if you hadn't been involved, if you hadn't been personally invested, the pride doesn't come out the other end. Um, and that's where it becomes false. That's where people look down and say, well, pride is a bad thing because you shouldn't be sort of claiming the credit for something where you didn't personally take a risk. Um, the last thing I want to show you is not, so, it's not socially uh, motivated at all, but I think it's another example of where um, you put yourself out there um, and you just hope, you've got down hope for the best. Um, whether that's whether that's for a, a social cause or whether that's for a client. And in this case, da, 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 this isn't even live yet, terribly low resolution picture, I'm sorry. Um, I went to PIMS in August. Um, I went as me uh, with an idea that I had. Um, they work at PIMS as part of Diageo and I managed to get a meeting with them and put together a little presentation about uh, a great big gap in the market. Indian food, Cobra, Tiger, King Fisher, beer, 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 beer. You don't drink beer, which by the way is about 36% of the population of the UK, then you've got nothing to drink in an Indian restaurant. Your choice is red and white. Wine is very good with beer. I could talk about this all day, but I won't. The point is, I went to them um, as me, 
with the backing of my agency and said, I've got this idea of hymns and curry, hymns and Indian food. Um, and they said, oh, we've never thought about this before. Give us a couple of months. They've given us a tiny little budget. And this week, we are running a pop-up, which you are all invited to, <laughs> on Saturday to come and drink some free pims and, um, and some, eat some samosas and try the taste combination for yourself. But this is keeping me up at night. I haven't slept for about two or three weeks. And when I do sleep, I dream of curry. Um, <laughs> and Hardeep Singh Kohli, who is our sort of brand ambassador, will be there on Saturday. But um, I am very much, I couldn't be more personally invested in, this, in the success of this campaign. Uh, whether it works or not will reflect directly on me. And it may not work. Um, I'm taking a risk. I have to, you know, I have to take a risk because I, I want to do this thing. Um, okay, it's not socially motivated. It doesn't have, um, it's not that um, we're going to raise lots of money for charity. But we're going to do something really great for PIMS and um, something that's not been done before. And that's always difficult no matter whether it's a social cause or whether it's um, a client cause. And actually, in my mind, and this might be the most controversial thing I say, uh, doing good in the world and the stuff that you can be proud of is, a, is on a continuum. And at one end, uh, there is raising loads of money for Centerpoint, which is another project that I'm working on, um, because we're being brave and doing something that no one's done before and, and, and trying to trying to create something that we can be proud of because it's raised a load of money and done a lot of good in the world. And at the other end of that spectrum of social good is actually keeping a business going, launching a business, providing employment for people in the world. Um, and that's what advertising does. It allows people to see your product, know how good your product is, um, and buy your product. So if I can help PIMS sell a lot more PIMS, then we'll make a lot more PIMS in the world and more people will be employed doing that more people will have the joy of drinking it with Indian food, um, which you're all going to try now, I'm sure. So I suppose my only argument today would be we're all human beings. We're not big companies. We're all, all those big companies, all those big corporations are made up of human beings. They all have egos. Uh, they all have things that they want to achieve in the world. Um, and they all are motivated by a sense of pride in what they do. Um, and we can't divorce that um, from the publicity that's received uh, for doing something good, whether that's um, on a at a client level or whether that's at a you know for a big social cause. Um, we're all motivated by those same things, almost no matter what it's doing at the end of it. So I don't know what I, what, how I would sum that up, but um, the more that we can all be personally invested in projects, the more brave we are, the more prepared we are to take risks, uh, the more immortal we will be. Um, and I'd rather have a society of people um, that were prepared to take those risks, that were personally invested, whether it, whether it gets all the publicity at the end of it, or whether it all fails. But those people, I'd rather have more of them than the people who are protecting themselves and never actually really achieving anything in the world. That's it. Thank you very much. You can all charm me on Twitter with that, so I'm sure, I'm sure you're all too charming. But, um... <laughs> okay, everybody, we've now got Neil Hardcastle from Neo Design. I think the idea is that we're sort of supposed to disagree with one another, but there's an awful lot of what Tara said, but I do actually find myself agreeing with it. I think you do need to be personally invested in things, and you do need to be to have that motivation to want to do good and to question the motives why. And I think I suppose my take on that really personally from what I'm working with Neo is just understanding a little bit more about, about what those risks entail and whether you can work collaboratively with people um, to mitigate those risks. It's not about not taking risks, but I think really about in that sense of understanding motivation and not doing it because of an ego, but perhaps sometimes doing it in spite of and that is the good we do, the best it can be, and understanding a little bit more about our motivations for that. So sort of set the tone for that, but Neil probably needs a bit more of an introduction than Ogilvy. Probably not a household name, we're not a big agency. We're a small independent agency uh, based in Brighton. It was founded somewhere around 11 years ago. Um, the name means new, and I think at that time the idea of a, an agency that's specifically focused on not-for-profits, for charities and stuff was quite a new idea. 
um, it was quite different to sectors like agency models. And I think historically there's always been a sense that a lot of work that was done in third sector and done in charities was done pro bono, done on the side, done, we, we may come under doing this, but we want to put something back. Like that. There's an element of the, that sector kind of always being seen a little bit as the poorer cousin, perhaps in lots of respects, you know, the feeling of the scraps of, of other tables. But I think during the last 10, 11 years, it's fair to say that that's changed massively. I think there's traditional lines between sectors, between first sector for profit, non for profit is blurred. And I think we do some work, we similarly do work with WWF, um, and they've got commercial partnerships with mega corporations like Sky and stuff to, kind of, you know, to, to bring funds in to raise awareness for what they do. And I suppose what that means really for the sector is that you know, charities and campaign organisations across the board are much more brand savvy, you know, much more brand aware, much more, I suppose, much more aware of the importance of brand and how it can establish, cut through and help them to have a voice in it, you know, in a heavily contested space. Um, and they're often competing with organisations that do have great big marketing budgets. You know, we do work with a, a range of charities across the board, some WWFs, and we work with other small local independence region and charities, that kind of thing as well. Um, we've also seen massively the owing to austerity and funding cuts. The, you know, a lot of charities, a lot of for good organisations, are having to take what would have been deemed traditionally a much more commercial approach, both to their business organisation um, and to their outward expression, that's their communications. And I suppose the other side, the other way around, we've also seen quite a lot of the um, first sector businesses, a lot of um, hardcore commercial for profits, uh, desperately trying to find ways to tell stories, to engage people on a human level. And charities have always been very, very good at this. There's a real shift, obviously, from broadcast brand. We will tell you what we do to actually engage in it and work with people and involve them collaboratively. So, and I think the other thing that's really important is that all businesses, irrespective of sector, I think education, traditional second sector is probably the same as this as well, um, are just increasing social and legal pressure to be more ethical, to be more transparent, to be more honest with people. And I think kind of discerning consumers, whether that's undergrads looking for where they want to study, or people choosing a product or service, or whether they want to donate money. You know, they want to know where, where things come from and at what cost. There's obviously pressure across across all industries really to to comply with that. That's the bare minimum is to be compliant. So we see lots of agencies that are doing a lot of things with them corporate responsibility and green and you know, green sustainable programs. But you know I think people are pretty pretty attuned to the see the greenwashing. I mean, you know, they, they know when they're being had, as it were. So I suppose for us, you know, we, we're no longer the new agency on the block. A lot of bigger agencies have specific wings, departments, teams who do this kind of work. Um, and we're one of a, a growing number of sort of third sector agencies or agencies who offer services in a specific area. So we did a bit of work sort of repositioning ourselves and having a look at how we talk about what we do earlier this year. Um, so we, we're not solely third sector anymore. We don't position ourselves as such, but we do try and Every client we take on, every project we take on, we work with, we discuss as there's only 11 of us in the, in the team. Um, but we discuss and we're unsure about it's the sort of work we'd like to get involved with, how we can make money, what sort of activities they're involved in. There's always a discussion at the heart of that. So I don't think it's really less personally invested in this at all. Um, but no, there is always a, I suppose a conversation about to what extent we want to to get involved with certain things. And this is true with charities as well as businesses. Like, you know. I can, yeah. <laughs> so, but we work with quite a range. Um, there's some international interests in there. There are some corporates in there, some for good, some um, social, social economy stuff. And you know, it's quite a wide range. But I also think it's, we. We generally don't work with massive budgets. Um, we always try and take a kind of a, a, an overriding principle, I suppose, really, is that, that the, the democratising effect of design. You know, you know, there's always a way of trying to find a getaway, getting a good message out there, helping people improve. If they've got a five and two k emergency to spend, if they've got next to nothing, that there's still always a way of trying to trying to do this without devaluing, without devaluing the work that they do, or devaluing what we bring to that for them, as it were. So I think it's also important that we don't do any pro bono work that really favours our clients pay us for the work that we do. And I think this essentially helps to establish a contract, it's a transaction, this helps to create a scope and some parameters for our projects. 
the name is to kind of be professional and to stay focused on delivering what's best for the client, not what's best for us. I think we do. We obviously want to do good work. We obviously want to put work out there that shows people what we're capable of. But it certainly isn't the primary goal of what we do. The focus is certainly some of the smaller charities we work with, some of the organisations we work with, they want to return an investment. They're paying us, they want to return an investment. We have to work really hard for that. And it is exhausting when you're personally invested in it. I agree completely, it is exhausting, but we have responsibility to deliver that to the client. If we're going to take risks, we need to be able to take them together, not us dragging them and people to be on a journey. We have to work more collaboratively than that with clients. So I think just a couple of case studies really that I wanted to talk through, some things we've worked on recently, I think illustrate this relatively well. Um, this is a flagship publication for Charity Bank, who are one of the biggest lenders in the, in the charity sector. They only lend to charities, schools, clubs, organisations, people trying to do good in the world. Um, they came to us with a brief pretty much to redo their portfolio this year. Lots of things have changed. It required due to massive growth, this heavy, dense fiscal document needed to be so many reams thick. And, and they came to us for a brief, and we kind of looked at them, we did the research, we kind of didn't just speak to the managers and the marketing people there, but kind of went some research with their, their frontline people, really, to have a, to see what actually what this really needed to do. And we worked out quite early on that what the brief was asking for wasn't actually what they needed, or what was best for them at all. So we kind of had to go through a long process with them, and I suppose a big part of the work you do when you work with people who are also trying to do good, that doesn't become hand-wringing or worthy, is, you know, is, is working collaboratively. We're only able to do what we do by working collaboratively. We certainly don't have a kind of reputation where people are necessarily going to come with us and stuff, but it's still about wanting to try and work with them to do good. And these people who are already trying to do the same. So everyone's got good intentions. I suppose it's fine way to work collaboratively to make those good intentions better, really, as best we can. So we kind of worked with them, art directing and source and sourcing photography shoots on a very tight budget. We kind of restructured the entire approach to this so it wasn't this yellow pages size document of tedious fiscal details. And really looked at ways we could kind of really shift the focus of this back onto the human element. The people they work with, they have a, we kind of anecdotally kind of happened across the fact that they they're really known for these fantastic relationships that they have with, with people locally and regionally, and this really needed to do much more to relay that. So we worked with them to help cross-reference, to simplify information through simple graphic design, you know, kind of principles. Really, we kind of introduced some good solid design basics. And then try to shift the focus back onto much more human interaction, really, and taking it away from this kind of fiscal document. Now, this, as brief, would have been, I don't know, a hundred and something page document full of compliance and legal information and everything else. Um, and what we delivered back was, uh, let's see, the much smaller document, um, not at all what they'd asked for. I suppose for us, the, the interesting thing to talk to you about really is how we got there with that. And I think this is a massive risk for the client. No, it's it's not a glamorous, gone winning thing. But this represents something that the client is blown away with. This is their flagship thing, this is what they use to go out to people, this is their the core bread and butter of how they operate day to day. Um, and we would we were working with them to try and sort of say what you're asking for is not what you need. This is a massive risk. Um, and I suppose the two things that are really important in terms of how we kind of managed to work with them collaboratively to get them to do that. And there's an, there's an ongoing relationship. We built a rapport with them. Um, it wasn't an in out campaign. We went, what can we do? Can we dip in this, do some good, and then scoop back off out again? Um, no, there was an implicit level of trust that we were focused on what they were needed, even if it wasn't what they were asking for. Um, and it wasn't about kind of us going in, you know, kind of trying to impress people, showboating, or kind of having a set of personal criteria for it. This is about developing a meaningful relationship with clients that we can do good work together and not be prescriptive and not tell people how, how they can do the good that they're looking to do in the world. Um, and I think the other key thing about this, and as with probably all the projects we do, is that we're getting paid. 
you know, this is not a pro bono project, this is not something we're going in and oh, the goodness of our hearts doing this for you. Yes, we care. Um, but this helps us up some really simple parameters. The project has a budget and a scope, and as such, we can then stay focused on what we need to deliver with that. We can give deliverables to the client. And we had to demonstrate value at each stage of the process. So, yes, we try and do good together. Yes, we want to take risks together, but we have to check back in at every stage, and we have to make sure that what we're doing is for the good of the client and not us getting carried away because we've got an opportunity to do something different, perhaps. Um, and I think probably not just on this project, but how I've heard about pro bono work and this kind of, oh, well, we can discount this and discount that. Anyway. And I think this is true across industries and sectors, is you know, if you don't have those kind of parameters, you don't have that kind of transactional relationship with the people you work with, then how would you ascribe value to what you do? How many sets of amends are reasonable? How, how can you position yourself with any authority and talk about what you do if there's no value to it? And this is really important, this is something that we do with all of our projects. And then the other one I want to talk about is um, Young Women's Trust. I'm trying desperately to do a name in shame, but this is a project effectively that we inherited after another agency, a very well-renowned agency, had gone in and done a <laughs> it's not, It's not you or you know, it's not you. But a similarly well-known agency had gone in. Uh, Young Women's Trust were originally um, YWCA. Um, they were founded in 1855. Um, they'd already had an unsuccessful rebrand about two years before they came to us um, as Platform 51. Um, so they came to us in a panic, actually, about three weeks before they had to have some materials out there. They, they announced the new name, they announced the change, and they needed to put this stuff out there. Um, and what they had would have been given to favour a pro bono wasn't really up to the task. Now they'd been given kind of what was on top and they'd asked for a rebrand and an unscoped pro bono project will do a rebrand. What they got was a logo and five, six pages, five, six sides of A4 as guidelines. Four pages of which were a lot of colours, you are. Was used. It was explaining the composition and not the essence, what it meant or how it was supposed to be used. Um, and it wasn't fit for purpose. Now there were things, I say, there weren't things about it they didn't like, and there was a certain amount, they were a certain amount invested in this and had to go. There wasn't time to go back to the drawing board. So we did some quite simple design basics work with them just on trying to lock things up a little bit, trying to introduce some meaningful guidelines that a, they could actually use to start talking about themselves as an organisation. Again, this was a real three weeks and a five and two early early's kind of budget. We didn't have a lot of time, there was no money to do photography. What we really wanted to be able to do with them was to actually tell the story of young women. Um, we had to find other ways around that. We had to work with what we had to a certain extent. So we worked using typography. We simplified some things just in terms of legibility, just in terms of how things would reproduce, and, and looked at ways that we could kind of give them a bold and credible voice that would actually engage the audience and not patronise them, but engage the audience they're talking about and the people they're talking to. Um, so a massive chunk of the budget we had, as much as our person who's head of the would have loved to have gone off and done photo shoot, and this and the else, actually went on tone voice guidelines. We did a massive amount of work with them about how they should be talking about social media, about, about how they talk to people in a way that it is confusing one because they talk to young women, but they also talk to a lot of policy makers, politicians, lots of people who are two very different ends of the spectrum. It was really about trying to find a way that, that we could talk to and about these young women, about them feeling patronised, in a way that's actually still going to be interesting and engaging for policy makers and politicians and so on and so forth. Um, so what we kind of did with that, I suppose really what enabled us to do that in a short space of time is we were honest, we were honest about what we could deliver. Um, we couldn't solve all the problems, we had three weeks, we had a tiny, tiny budget in which to do this. And what we wanted to do was actually get them something that was usable for them, something that was practical and usable for them. Someone else already had a go, and whether it was award season or something, a heart-wrenching story about a need to give something back, but what they given back wasn't fit for purpose. Um, we had some frank conversations about what we could achieve, what we could give back, um, and it was the start of a really decent relationship with them. We didn't 
go in and say, we're going to wave a magic wand and fix everything for you. We mm -hmm. were quite clear about what we could go in, what we could achieve. And I think, you know, obviously this helped demystify the process for me. This wasn't, we didn't go in a position of design or an agency or some magical relationship where all this incredible stuff happens. We told them what we were going to do, we delivered what we said we were going to deliver. And I think this helped to build a massive amount of trust. And throughout the year since, that's been a big part of what we've done. We continue to work with them. Yes, we don't have enormous budgets, but we have since gone back and done photography. We have since gone back and done more work with the graphics. And started to build something that actually exists in a usable living brand and not just a logo and issue guidelines. And I suppose the where we're at with that now is that they don't come to us. We've got to look them through a point of relationship. We are invested in it. We're invested in on a journey with them. So they don't come to us for grief anymore. They'll come to us to pick up the phone and say, we've got problems getting through to this audience. How do you think we can tackle that? How do you think we can do that? And I think it's a very different way of looking, perhaps, this idea of being personally invested. Yes, we are personally invested. We don't know all the answers, though. Our clients don't know all the answers either, but we kind of work together collaboratively to try and achieve the best good that we can in all the things that work. And a big part of that has to come from being invested, from being motivated, but also from being honest with people about what we can and can't achieve. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you understand what pro bono means? I just wanted to make sure that everybody knows what that means. Do you know what that means? Does anybody know what it means? For good. For good, yes. Yes. Yeah, so what that means, that's right. So what that means in practice in this industry is that, that there's usually no money or very, very little money. So big agents, the way kind of a broad brush stroke, the way it usually works is that big agencies can afford to do pro bono work because they've got lots of other streams of income coming in. So um, whereas small agencies like Neo probably can't afford to do pro bono work. Okay? And I think it's also fair to say you wouldn't... You and you don't agree, agree with the whole... Because it devalues what we do. Mm. How do we then charge someone or yes. describe the value to what we do yeah. if you can do it for free? Exactly. Okay, so that's your argument. Okay. So um, we're going to spend, um, like we did last week, so just spend five minutes just by yourself making some notes and thinking, and then another five minutes maybe talking to the people next to you, um, um, reviewing what the outro speaker said, thinking about what your opinion might be, thinking of questions that you might want to ask the speakers, um, and then we'll kind of open it up and have a bit of a chat amongst some of us in the room. Okay? Okay guys, um, you've had a little bit of time to um, reflect on what our two speakers um, um, brought forward this morning and think over their arguments and think about the two different positions that they come from. Um, so can open up to you guys now and hear your thoughts perhaps and hear any questions you might have for our speakers. So I heard there was a very lively discussion going on over there. Um, did you have any thoughts to share or any questions that you'd like to put forward? What are your earliest signed for babies? Um, I don't know actually, it was before I started. Oh. And honestly, I think we did um, suite of communications, maybe some annual reporting and that reporting and stuff. I don't know if it was a few years before I started. Did they pay for that? All our clients pay. Yeah, I was going to ask about um, the pro bono work. Um, do you think that the problems of that are to do with a lack of, sort of the personal investment? Um, um, no, I think there's probably still a level of personal investment. I think it's questioning why you personally invest in it, perhaps, and actually how much you can give. And I think for me personally, a big part of it is about how, how do you bring things to level of personal investment? When, when do you hand something, if you're doing something for free, for the greater good, at what point do you get to hand something over with pride, being invested in, and, and, as finished? Because it, there's no scope, there's no parameters around it to contain the project. But I think for me the difficulties come from ring fencing that, really. And if, there is, if it isn't ring fenced by a set of criteria, by a set of deliverables, it's very difficult to, to know when a final handover point is, or that's our involvement on this project over. I mean, that's, that for me is the difficulty with it. I think that's true of 
any program at work or any spec or any things that people are trying to get you to do for nothing. I've say, I'm with pro bono work. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Although, the, I was just saying, the Girl Generation piece was not pro bono. That was a, um, a design brief that was uh, paid for. But Ogilvy were part, are, are part of the consortium um, that have created that campaign. So we are, we're kind of, we, we're funded by the Department of International Development along with the other NGOs in the, in the organisation. So it's, it's slightly different. But I've got to say, I've always found pro bono clients um, to be, uh, in some cases, to be the hardest. And um, I think it's very interesting because basically the conversation we're having is whether or not pro bono is a good idea. Um, and I think pro bono work can allow great big fat agencies who have an enormous amount of skills and expertise and experience uh, working in very tough uh, competitive conditions. Um, it can allow those people to do some work that they're really proud of and, and that has a social cause. Um, that keeps them going and keeps them inspired but it can also it's also a resource thing of it allows those people who are very very busy some time in their in their day ideally when they can um, do some social good so it's for the benefit of all of us um, so it's just kind of tapping into a resource that might otherwise be in the closed little world of uh, corporate consumer money business and allowing some of that resource um, to play out in another way that is very fulfilling for them um, but also hopefully does some good doesn't mean to say it, can, it can't go wrong, and like that case with UK Music, it was a it was a terrible case of things going terribly wrong. But my, that was the only that was the only experience I had where it was where it was that bad. Normally, uh, people are, are very polite when they're paying you. They are very polite usually because you have got a contract. Um, so sometimes when they're there is this thing of when they're not paying you, maybe things aren't ring fenced in quite the same way. Um, but I would argue that that makes the relationship at its best even more collaborative. It has to be a collaboration. It has to be you both working for the same end goal and feeling like the same team um, and trying to take each other on the journey with you. Otherwise, it can all fall apart and it's a disaster. And it doesn't mean to say that doesn't happen, but overall, I am certainly very glad that pro bono work exists within big agencies because I think the world would miss out on a lot of talent. Um, and those people would miss out on So your argument is the, the budget is there in the big agency, the resources are there anyway, yeah. why don't we use them, yeah. um, invest them in social yeah. good projects? And it doesn't always work, it doesn't always, like I said, it doesn't always But the principle well. you agree with, yeah. whereas you have got a different opinion than that, you say in principle this undermines um, client relationships and does not constitute a, a fulfilling working relationship that works long term. I think one of the arguments that you made that I thought was interesting when you gave your presentation is that you're interested in going on a journey with the client and, and, and establishing a long term relationship with the client. And would you say that is not possible with pro bono? Um, um, I, think it's, I think it's very difficult and I think if we work on a vanity project, mm. or we've got a bit of time so we can do that for nothing, or we've got some great talent here so we can knock mm. that together, you know, it's a great relationship going to start with vanity at its, mm. you know, at its starting point, you know, if that's, if that's the motivation mm. for being invested in it, is, is, is that focused on the client getting the best good they can have it? Are you actually helping them or are you helping yourself? So is your, so, is your argument that is a vanity kind of exercise in a big agency. It can go, be. Oh, let's give it them a bit of, because you were saying it's, it's, it's nice to give um, creative people in the agency the opportunity to do something yeah. good. You would describe that as a kind of vanity kind of activity. I think it certainly can be, yeah. yeah. Don't really think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying, I'm saying, oh, I'm shocked. So, but no, I think it can be, and I think I've certainly experienced that it can have an element of vanity, but mm. to it. I think it's all, again, it comes back to this idea of personal investment. It depends on if you've got the right team working on the right project. So, that's not a particularly good example, but um, one of the guys I used to work with on Hellman's really, really loved sharks. Like, really loved sharks. Um, he really, really loved sharks. And he wouldn't have ever thought about him, but this was a major passion of his. And um, he was absolutely outraged um, and disgusted by what happens uh, with shark fin soup and how sharks are treated in the wild and thrown back in the ocean to, to drown and to die. And it, it is actually an um, appalling state of affairs. So um, he personally drove a project in the agency to get a bit of resource um, to, uh, to make some work, some creative work, um, 
that would help publicize um, this charity that works with sharks uh, and what they do. Now, you've got different interests. You've got his absolutely personally invested in making this campaign a success and in doing something that he can feel very proud about. Then you've got the agency's interest, which is ultimately in uh, you know, making great creative work, looking like a good agency, keeping the business moving, keeping money coming in. Um, and if the agency think that uh, they can win some creative awards by making this stuff about sharks, great. Every, everyone's interests are aligned and Ben uh, gets some money from the agency, some resource basically, to invest in making this shark film and uh, doing what good he can. Now his motivation, you could say, is completely pure. He loves sharks. Um, the agency's motivation, no, it's not pure uh, because it's a whole raft of people Um, and, but at the, at, nonetheless, where there's this nice um, convergence of interests, Ben gets the, the money and the resource. The agency isn't personally invested in the success of that, that campaign. Um, but it sees an opportunity to maybe win some awards, to maybe make a name for itself. And if, if sharks win, then I'm happy, mm. basically. Um, so I think a lot of good can come from that kind of pro bono work, but you need Ben. You need the love of sharks. If you don't have that personal investment, that person, that group of people, ideally, uh, that team that are willing to, willing to, you know, we we were up all night. Pay, I mean, that sh shutters project was tiny, but you're not getting paid to stand out in the cold. Uh, you know, no one's paying you by the hour. No one's saying, "Oh, good for you being here." Um, you know, you're standing out there. You're managing a lot of stuff. It's very, very stressful. Um, and nobody's really, you know, uh, nobody's patting on back while you're doing it. You have to want to do it. You have to feel that you are personally getting something out of um, being there and doing it, even if the agency is very happy for you to do it, which is great. Um, but it's, I, to me, it's essentially, there are no companies, there are no businesses, there are only individuals, there are only people. Uh, and if you have those key people in place that really want to do something that they can be proud of, then use them. Society should use them. Got any other questions or comments? I've also heard some kind of interesting discussion going on over there with you guys. They're talking about my ideas. <laughs> um, we have like a question about whether when should like a designer like us decide whether we should do a pro bono or should we like as a budding designer? You won't have a choice. Someone will come to you and yeah. say, Hey, you know how to work Photoshop. Uh, you know how to do this. It, um, it will just land on your lap, and you will, and you will go, "Oh my God, I've got way too much work on. I can't possibly do this." Or you will say, "Oh, I'll somehow fit it in." And again, it comes down to like how much do you feel about this cause? How much, how much time do you have? How well can you balance it? How much do you love the person who's asking you to do it? I've just asked um, a friend of mine to come and spend a couple of hours on Saturday filming people drinking pims completely for free. Because we have no money left, the budget is completely gone, and we want to make a success of this campaign. Because if we do, then um, you know, then there could be more work out of it, and it could be a much bigger thing. Uh, yes, the agency will win if that's the case, but actually, if they're doing it for me, they're doing it because I really want them to do it, and I really want this to work, um, and it all reflects on me because it's been my campaign. So um, you've got to pull strings and, and ask for favors. And, and you, you might not do it for the social good, but you might do it because you really fancy them or like they're, they're just your best friend, you know? And a lot of good comes from that kind of stuff too. But when should we like say no? Do we say yes to if all? If you don't care. If you don't care enough. Like if would, like, a company comes to you and say like, uh, you could use this for experience and stuff and they're just milking you. Should you say no or? <laughs> I, you just do it for I don't think it's right probably for either of us to sit here and tell you about the decisions that you make actually, but I think it is essential whatever you go on to do that you have a, an idea of what matters to you and you make your choices based on that. But don't be under any illusions that pro bono work or the exposure that comes from it will lead to paying work. Because from my it? experience it doesn't. It doesn't yeah. at all. It's also very difficult for that person who's come to you but just we're going to get a budget for this just around the next corner or the next stage of this campaign or whatever they're not going to come to you if they had money to spend with you they would have come to you with money with a budget of money to spend if you want to do it because it's something you believe in you believe you've you know you can have a soliloquy and understand that the the, the, the exposure or what it might do for your portfolio or whatever is worth it to you great but I, 
don't make that decision on the promise that there'll be pain work coming after it, because from my experience it doesn't. Yeah. It's the true. best advice I can give on that. It happens in the music industry all the time and in advertising. I do quite a lot of stuff in the agency with um, with music and what we call sync, synchronisation, the picture, the image and the music to it. And um, it's rife in the industry that people will ask for um, hardly any, like they will say, oh, we, have, we don't really want to pay any money, we want an up-and-coming artist, someone who could benefit from the exposure on our great advertising. And actually, what they want is something for free. Mm -hmm. And um, it's no good, and it, it does devalue um, the product. But I, that's often that's coming from a from a position where you've got a client who does actually have money and could pay money if they really wanted to. If they really wanted to invest in it. So is pro bono work really only sensible if you are already in a position of privilege? I think you have to, you have to be able to afford to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and. I mean, I say that, a really good friend of mine has uh, just been uh, made redundant, which again is why it is actually important that our businesses stay afloat, you know, that we have to look out for the bottom line. Um, you know, there are agencies and there are times when I've worked at the agency where we've been told, hey guys, pull back, like, we can't be doing so much pro bono work, there's so many people doing little projects in the agency and actually the agency can't fund those personal projects, um, and ultimately, when that happens, we, you know, people are made redundant. Um, but she has been made redundant and um, is taking that as an opportunity to invest more time in a project that she and I have been working on together. Um, because you know she she's got time right now. That's the thing that she can afford to spend. Um, that will change when she gets a job. I've done it. But um, right now, she's yeah, she can afford to invest that time. I think it's what you can afford to what you can afford to do if you're a big agency and you've got resource and you've got people. Then why not? And everyone's socially conscious. Everybody's a human being, and my CEO is a human being and wants us to do good things in the world. So. Got any other questions or comments? Yes, please. Um, so then, how does your agency decide which pro bono projects they'll take and which they reject? That's a good question. Um, well, like I say, right now, uh, or maybe not right now, but there have been times when we've been told no pro bono because we cannot afford it because things are not good financially um, in which case that's a very easy decision um, or in terms of how much quite often it is who's, it's, 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 it's again it's the people in the agency it's who's got the budget so it might be ECD my executive creative director is the most powerful person in the agency really uh, he has personally um, a certain amount of budget that he can invest towards uh, projects. It varies from year to year how much that budget will be, but he can invest a certain amount towards projects that he thinks um, will ultimately aid the creds of our agency, um, whether that's from winning awards or whether that's from just doing the best job that we possibly can for a client that makes a, a great case study. Uh, so he'll be able to invest money in making a film about the work that we did um, that we can then show our, our, client, our future clients and prospective clients. So he will have a lot of decision-making power, and a lot will depend on whether he sees uh, return on investment um, for the agency, and and also whether you know whether again whether he's personally invested in the campaign. I don't what think he cares about shop. Investment mean in a pro bono um, work scenario. Um, so <laughs> winning awards, winning, um, winning awards, mm -hmm. publicity for the agency. Um, Winning awards, publicity for the agency, and uh, a creds reel that you're happy to take to prospective clients and say, this is the kind of clever thinking that we do. Mm. So, like, I mean, the, the babies thing, oh, I don't keep coming back to that, but it was a very, very small little thing that I managed to get a tiny bit of budget out of the agency from one person who had some. Um, and I went to a couple of different people, and my ECD didn't want to have anything to do with it. And he didn't even want to enter it for the awards at the end of the, at the end of it. So, you know, he was not invested whatsoever in this project. Yeah. Um, but Ogilvy's a big place, and I found the people that would invest um, and did want to get behind it. Um, what was your question? How do you measure um, oh, yeah. return on investment on in pro bono work? So, like with with that, you know, we won a gold lion at the end of it. We've got like, the highest accolade you can, like certainly in Ogilvy, a gold lion is the highest thing that you can get within the agency. And um, 
So that and that lovely little film that we can show to our clients that says, oh, we think about things in a slightly alternative behavior and economics nudge theory type way, rather than just, hey, here's a TV ad. Um, that's, that's great, and that's a, that's a good return on investment. But ultimately, there was such a small amount of money that went into that project. Um, the return on investment that I was expecting was a, or hoping for, was a nice, uh, maybe a piece of Radio 4, which would take it. That was lovely. But I was literally hoping for a, um, an article in the Evening Standard that would mention us and say that we're a kind of agency that, that thinks about things in a slightly different way. Um, that, was the, that was the return on investment that we were looking for. We, it, it went much further than that, but that was all. So the return bonus. on investment is a kind of publicity slash award winning. So that's, that's yeah. how you would how, how the agency would measure it. For this thing, yeah. I mean, for me, like obviously, for it all to happen, it requires again, like the people sure. who are personally invested. And for me, what I want to get out of it is not the same as what the agency wants to get out of it. But I have to persuade someone to be my client and give me some money, like to give me some money, basically to fund it. Um, and so. So it's aligning yeah. personal drive with maybe a more yeah. commercial, Cynical, commercial yeah. Yeah. Um, outlook yeah. in the agency. How do you get someone to give you some money, mm. basically, to do something that's good? But you, you do need to have those people um, that are the ones, the driving force in it all. Um, and it's actually, I know I put the pins thing at the end because I wanted to tell you what's happening. But also, uh, because I think it's a weird example of where um, it is entirely my thing. Like, again, this is my baby. I am obsessed with PIMS. I think this is a good idea. I took it to Diageo. I wrote the presentation. I did all the research. And they went along with it. And the agency has gone along with it and gone, this is great. OK, like, let's invest some money and some time and some people in helping Tara make a success of this. But ultimately, if it lives or dies, it will be on me. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, yeah, yeah, it's not for the social good. But it's it's very much a similar kind of mechanism of like where you've got to put yourself out there a little bit. And I instead of persuading the agency to give me some money to invest in a pro bono project, I persuaded Diageo to give me a little bit of money to invest in a little trial thing. But it's it's the same kind of same kind of mechanic. And I, I honestly see it as a continuum. Um, and all of those things are the things that you can be proud of in your life. And some of them are really bloody brilliant and great and big, and the stuff that I'm hoping to do with Centerpoint, I'll be a lot more proud of than the stuff that we did with the shutters, mm -hmm. even though stuff we did with the shutters might get more publicity, but it'll, Centerpoint will be a much bigger, more impactful social piece. Mm -hmm. But equally, I'm going to be proud of the stuff that I do with PIMS if it's successful, so. Any other questions or comments? Yes, please. Um, you were just mentioning about the PIMS uh, project, right? So you said that uh, your brain child and your brain behind this kind of, uh, this movement or this project, and you've taken that like right to the doorstep of the client and you've told them like your entire idea. Like, is there any fear that like, the client will take your idea and like leave you out of the Oh yeah, there was at the beginning there was a whole conversation about they wanted us to sell them the idea and uh, this which was crazy because it's a business strategy. It's not a creative idea. Yeah. It's a creative a creative business strategy, but it's a business strategy, it's not a um, advertising campaign or anything like that. Um, and so what the, what the agency wins in me taking it to Diageo is not a, a case study, it's not a um, award film or anything like that, it's a prospective client. It's we're warming up Diageo to do more business with us. Mm -hmm. If this project works, they will, um, we will work with all this, we will do all future work rolling forward. And I think mm -hmm. we're making that contractual, but essentially right now it's me and a couple of people at Diageo who uh, have a very, very solid relationship. They could, like we talked about at the beginning, they could have run off and done it themselves. They, they don't owe us anything except on a personal level. And I just, I can't stress that enough, is I have my, my cousin is like a corporate conspiracy theorist. He thinks that uh, P&G and Unilever and Coca-Cola and all of these people are somehow doing evil in the world. Um, and I just sit there and I say to him, people don't eat money, right? People are, like, all these companies are made up by human beings, and they're all gonna live on planet Earth for, for now, anyway. Like, there's nowhere else they can go. So they're just as invested in you are, as you are in the environment and all of these other sorts of things, um, fair trade, whatever it might be. Uh, they wanna make the world a better place, but they've just got loads of sh other shit that gets in the way, like keeping their job, 
and uh, they don't want to take risks. They don't want to change the way things are quite often um, because the default is to just stay in my safe little protected zone and not really put myself out there because if things go wrong, it reflects on me. Um, so I just, the only thing I would really stress is that all of these companies are all made up of human beings. If they do bad things, somebody did a bad thing. Um, and like, they all take responsibility together. The problem is pushing them out of their comfort zone and reminding them that they are actually quite powerful because people don't feel powerful. The clients I work with, most of the time, don't think they are changing culture, which they are quite often. You know, the difference between uh, the guys in the 1960s in Coca-Cola who decided to put a black family for the first time um, in advertising uh, and totally normalize that on, on TV, um, the difference between them choosing to do that versus a, a kind of typical American white 2.4 children family, um, that was a big change and yet when they made that decision, I doubt it was one where they really felt we're changing the world. Um, but they did and it, it shifted those kind of measures, those kind of actions, individually small as they may seem, do shift culture over time. The one thing that I think big agencies can help some clients do, all clients, is remind them that they're actually very very powerful in the world, that money should be spent doing the best thing that we can, whether that's for PIMS or whether that's for um, WWF, we should be doing whatever we can with whatever resources we have to do the things that we're most proud of. And that's actually not easy. That's what makes us, that's what makes it good. Got so any I've other, got, sorry, no, did you want to respond to that? Yeah, I've got, yes. I suppose it's a question for Tara that you popped into my head as we were talking there, I think. I think the Shutters is a great project. You know, I think it's I think it's awesome. And I mean we illustrate the example of the Garden of the Sharks and things like that. Mm. Um, and then we talk about the PIMS. Obviously, this is a loss leader in some respects mm. or something that you're hoping. So, so what happens with the campaigns you do when the money's not there? What happens to those good causes mm. at the point where the money is no longer there? So the, the, what happens to, to that good that's being done? Does that just fizzle out? Does that dissipate? You've had your return on investment on it. And that just stops and goes. And I suppose yeah. campaigns, it's easy enough to do that. They have a life cycle, they yeah. have a. Mm -hmm. But for brands or for organisations yeah. who are sustainably trying, you know, yeah. trying to run their business in a sustainable way and continue yeah. to put good messages out yeah. there, how does that work well, I think in that respect? One thing you'd find is, like, like I say, we work with WWF, we work with Greenpeace, probably somewhere in the world, we work with everyone. And um, we're not the only ones. So what you find with a lot of pro bono clients and a lot of really big clients like uh, WWF, is they work with everybody. They don't just work with Ogilvy, they work with a whole bunch of other um, agencies, whether that's doing uh, specific projects or design or um, different things in different markets. They have a lot of different agencies to call on. Um, and to some extent, quite often they're spreading their bets. So um, if they're relying on love and favors and people who are personally invested in getting stuff done, um, and they don't have the money to support that, then you know it's very difficult to um, to live on love forever. Um, and quite often, I think uh, it makes a lot of sense to you for a pro bono for a, a client that doesn't have any money to almost use and abuse the industry at large rather than one particular agency. Um, and they they spread the load that way. So I think uh, it doesn't. What it doesn't do is give sustainable kind of relationship between client and agency, because I think quite often the client will have to go to multiple different agencies to get stuff done, and over time, what it does is place an awful lot of emphasis on the client themselves to maintain the integrity of the brand. I think it, I think pro bono, I think uh, charity, um, the clients who work in charities have to work a lot harder to um, maintain their brandedness, because I think it is hard to get that. So you would argue that that is not a sustainable um, way for a client to go about their business, have, kind of going in and have, taking these bits of pro bono work from different agencies. You would argue for a more sustained relationship with one agency yeah. that's consistent and that addresses to a degree, the client yeah, needs. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we work with WWF as well on mm. working on a couple of digital projects at the moment. We mm. tend to, WWF do absolutely spread their yeah. enormous workload around the largest charities yeah. in the world. Um, but with lots of other campaigning organisations and people that we work with, a big chunk of what we do is going in and doing that strategy mm. work with them and actually giving them that consistency mm. and giving them a sustainable platform mm. upon which to build a brand mm. that isn't 
seeing what falls from other people's tables yeah. every six mm -hmm. months or every year. Yeah. I think that's probably be part of what honed my argument, I suppose, really, mm -hmm. is that we see the value of doing that kind of work mm -hmm. as a sustainable approach to design mm -hmm. that isn't a what's cool this week or yeah. who can help so us out this week. So it's less project based actually... in a way. It's like it's building a relationship that runs over time where maybe the pro bono work, that's more project based. I would say, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's probably more project based and it puts a lot more emphasis on the clients to manage that yeah. brandedness mm -hmm. and, make, and people get carried away and people do the wrong thing and uh, you know they do things that fail or that don't reflect very well on the brand as well and I just think it, it places a lot more emphasis on the clients yeah. to manage their workload. Um, than the agency, which would typically be where all of that would sit, that kind of brand stewardship would be our job. Yeah. Well, don't get me wrong, as well, I mean, everyone wants repeat business. Yeah. As, as well, yes. and it, there's a solid, so there's a there's a solid practical, there's a strategic argument into well. wanting yes. people to stay with you and, and building a kind of relationship as well. It's not all out of the goodness of our hearts. We yeah. want people to come back to yeah. us and to build those relationships with us. Mm. That we can, Know, have that mutual security, I suppose, and also do good work together. Mm. I think a big part of doing good work is the whole get to be really honest with each other. Mm. Mm. And if you can't have that gloves off honesty with clients, mm. you're only ever working on a certain level, aren't you? Mm. You can't go in and tell them their business model is fundamentally flawed or that their stakeholders mm. are really unsettled. Mm. Then it's very, very difficult to actually get under the skin and do that kind of mm. sometimes quite messy work. And as mm. you probably know from working with charities and community organizations, it can be quite messy because yes. everyone is so emotionally invested. Yes. Yeah. So any other comments or questions from from the group? I think we kind of got to really the the core of, of the difference here now in the last kind of minute, two minutes. Um, so Neil would argue that um, working with clients over over time, you build a relationship, you kind of have an understanding, you build up things together, um, which is not possible in the kind of project-based pro bono work. Um, project-based pro bono work, you've got the advantages of having a big agency with lots of um, resources available to do really kind of eye-catching big, um, you know, campaigns that might get a lot of attention and might get a lot of publicity for the good cause. So I think that is the kind of core of, of, of the difference. Would you kind of agree with that? Well, I would say if the, if, like, if the money is there and everyone can afford to, or, or, the money or the love, like if your mm. CEO just, I mean, we've had a long, long time relationship with Amnesty, with, We've done a load of rebranding, kind of brand stewardship work for them. Um, there are different. There will be charities within any kind of organisation that maybe just have a very long-standing relationship. Ideally, you would have that relationship with all pro bono work. But if the money isn't there, um, and I'm, I wish it was, like, but if it's not, then yeah, I think that's the kind of almost the nature of the beast that you can invest what you can. Sure. Great. Okay. Any other questions or comments from you guys? Yes, I actually have a question to Tara from designer perspective. Um, let's assume that your uh, company asks you to work on a project, pro bono for the project, uh, that doesn't affect you on a personal level. You are not attached emotionally yep. to this at all. And you know they are not going to pay. Mm. How do you motivate yourself mm -hmm. to actually, you know, yeah, put effort into this campaign, and you know because from your previous experience that they can be rude to you. Yeah, um, I think then you. I mean, it's fine. You're getting paid. You know, I've got a job. I'm very lucky. Um, so if my boss tells me to work on this, I work on that. I you know? understand. So that's that. cool. Okay. But then you do. I think you need those people in your team at least who do who really do care about this cause and actually I find it very hard when I'm working on any client not to really care about it like I just um maybe I'm just too empathetic or something but I just whenever I work, clients really care about their cause clients like whether that's selling fabric conditioner or like uh, or um, stopping uh, FGM like it, it's, it's strange, but people, when they're working on something and it consumes their life, uh, they love it and they are engaged with it and they're passionate about it, no matter almost what it is. And I feel that that always, pretty much always infects me in some way. Um, I'm working with Castrol Engine Oil at the moment, and I don't even drive. I've got no interest in cars whatsoever. But they're very passionate people who are doing actually doing a lot of good in the world in terms of trying to change the oil industry and trying to move it on. But um, 
yeah, it's it's not the same. Um, and I think it's it, we call it casting. So um, when you are going to do a pitch or you're going to put together a team to work on any kind of client brief, you want the right cast. And ideally, you want people who, whose personal interests align with the client. Um, and that's that's when, like, I, I just think that's where magic can happen, and that's when the, the best result can be had for everybody. So that's what you strive for. It doesn't always happen, but I think that's you try for that. And if you don't, you just you just go along with it and hope somebody else is kind of feeling it a bit more. Fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it, yeah. I'd absolutely agree with that. I think irrespective of the differences aside, if your heart's not in it in some respect, mm -hmm. you know, you're never going to do that. And however, whatever level you choose to have that personal investment, that personal engagement with something, you know, you've got to stay aware of things that you do and don't care about or yeah. do to me. And that might be a kind of personal level. You know, I've worked in, I've always worked in this sector, as it were, and I've worked on cigarettes and all sorts in the past, you know, fast food, consumer goods and all sorts. And sometimes it's the personal relationship you might have with, with the client. Yes, that yeah. you have a real fondness for, for yeah. that person. You want you want to help them do good. Yeah. You, know, you want to help them do their job better and stuff. But if that's not there, then get out. Mm. <laughs> Actually, yeah. that's not there on some level. But like Tara is in position that she can be pretty selective about the project she is working on. Uh, because it's a big company. But what about you? Can you be selective if you, you know, don't feel like let's say cooperate with that? For a small lady, most of you, yeah. uh, everyone has a financial problem. I'm not sure it's necessarily fair to say, oh, they need to worry about money. No, more money, more, more, more money, more problems. More <laughs> money, more problems, though, isn't yeah. it? I think, in lots of respect. But I think being a smaller agency and a smaller group of people enables us to be able to make choices as a group about whether we choose to work on, on this, whether we want to handle this project. And sometimes it might be that three or four people in the you know, in the studio, do feel a certain way about something, so they would be the people who pick that up, but it's unanimous and it doesn't come in through the door. But I think we've had these decisions to make a few times when... You have some... been quite selective as an agency, haven't you? You have turned, what Kira's told me, is that you have turned work down. When someone like a BP comes knocking, asking about, we want to work with us on a big sustainability, you know, that goes through a process of scrutiny. Do we believe them? You know, do, we, do we believe that this isn't just a commercial greenwashing exercise? And this is actually something that we can do good work on. But we're not just, you know, as the industry is just polishing the tab. We've got some respects, really. And I think it's really important to have Guys, that, can you keep it down at the back, sense, please, until know, we that, finish? Thank and you. And it is something that perhaps in small organisations is easier to do. It's easier to have that, that honest conversation about it. And sometimes this is not always agreed upon. Okay, any other comments, last comments? Um, so, did you want to make a quick announcement about the Christmas yes. lecture, Kira? I do. Um, so there's, there's two notices actually. One is that the tickets for the Christmas lecture are on sale this afternoon. Uh, they were a pound each. And they are not just a ticket for the lecture, they are a raffle ticket. There's raffle prizes. There's Santa and his secret elves in the as well. I think the speaker for the lecture next week for the Christmas lecture is Joan Wood, uh, formerly of Tomato. Um, and the other is that I've got a Q&A hour between 2 and 3 o'clock today, every Wednesday between 2 and 3, I've got an announcement up on Moodle. If anyone has any d &I 2 questions for me, they can find me outside my office for one hour. Yeah. Okay. okay, and as I said at the beginning, next week we've just got a casual drop in. Any kind of questions or any thoughts you have about your publications, Kira, Douglas, and I will be here to help you with your publications. Got a question? Uh, Phil is selling tickets. Uh, so it's a hunt Phil down after <laughs> those. Uh, he's around, he's, he's doing two sides this afternoon, so he's around in the van, he's just got order tickets on him. So he'll either be just here, the other side of the yellow orange, or he'll be down near his boxes of those. Um, yeah, the drop-in session for next week, bring all of your material, come as a group, bring all of your material with you, all of your documentation, we're going to help you get it into a publication format. 
Uh, so we, um, we've also got the lovely Douglas, as I sent out in the briefing, we've got the lovely Douglas for the, for the morning as well, helping out on, on finding and, and the possibilities for your publication. Uh, so, yeah, prepare for it, bring stuff in for us, okay? Thank you. Thank you so much.